All right, well, joining us now here on set, Art Hogan, National Securities Chief Market Strategist, and David Bonson, a CIO of the Bonson Group. David, I want to start with you because you own McDonald's. The stock getting hit uh, quite hard, feeling the heat. What's, what, what, what's your take? Why do you like it? Would you be buying here? Well, it's a smaller weighting for us than it's been. We bought it at the financial crisis. It was one of only two Dow stocks that was up in 2008. Uh, the stock has more than tripled since then, and the dividend has more than tripled since then. It's actually one of the highest returning stocks in American history, all in line with dividend growth. So things that are somewhat transitory quarter over quarter that can impact earnings numbers have never affected us much, and riding through that has helped us a lot. That said, the difference is the stock used to trade 15 times. Now it's trading 25 times. Even forward, it's about 20 times. So it's just expensive. Uh, but you still have a company growing its dividend about 8% per year for 40, 50 years. Um, we like the fact that the management has done such a good job riding through what's been a difficult decade, reinventing their menu, things like that. But it isn't the higher conviction name in our dividend growth portfolio right But now. talk about some of that reinvention, because one of the reasons why that multiple went up is because of all of those changes Easterbrook made, particularly with the automation. Anyone who's walked into right, a McDonald's in recent years has seen the change. I can remember going into a McDonald's three, four years ago, and I wouldn't want to stay in there more than two minutes. Now, all the ones near me, near my house, I mean, they're immaculate. I mean, they're great. They have the kiosk where you can order without having to go up. So this has brought a lot of customers to the store. That's, of course, has boosted the multiple. But then I'm not sure what the growth rate is needed to support a 25, 27 multiple. It's more on same store. They have mm -hmm. to continue to get that organic yeah. growth. And then, of course, they continue to have great global expansion. One of the, Now, of course, Chipotle's had a huge year. But I remember five years ago, the idea was young people will never go to McDonald's again. Mm -hmm. And Chipotle's the newest, coolest thing. McDonald's went up. 100%, Chipotle went down 70%. Mm -hmm. Now, Chipotle's on its way back. But my point is, they cleaned up the stores. They also simply are not relying on an only millennial, hip, urban mm -hmm. customer. They're very diversified in their customer base. But the financials tell the story. This is something we talk about a lot, including on this show before. The dividend is not the reason to buy it. The dividend is telling us the reason to buy it. It's that it is a well-run company with very disciplined financials, a lot of balance sheets, strength. We bought it originally as a real estate play that sold cheeseburgers. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's, it's now real estate, cheeseburgers, incredible organic growth. It's a global story. So there's a lot to like about McDonald's. I haven't, of course, got to dive into this quarter's numbers yet other than headlines. Looks like it's going to open down a bit here today, yeah. but still an amazing story the last couple of years. What about the delivery side of the equation? I mean, they sort of made that push, pulling in Uber Eats and some of the other delivery companies. And that seems to be kind of the big risk for a lot of these chains is that you have have other chains that have really full-on embraced uh, the delivery model, like Burger King uh, and others, and then McDonald's was a little bit late to that game. Yeah, but see, I think that McDonald's has held up their margins better mm -hmm. by being late to it, and I do think the drive through story is just different than a lot of the fast casual mm -hmm. companies that are doing well with your food delivery services. Mm -hmm. So they seem to have a very good understanding of their customer and they're meeting that need. To pivot off of that, you also own our Procter & Gamble, yeah. right? So so how do you look at sort of where we are in that safety then rotation? Like, is safety still safe? Well, see, I, I really view this from a bottom-up standpoint, and that's what's been very interesting early. That's why you and Ramin get along so well. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, think, I think that actually this earnings season is telling a little bit different of a story. I don't think it's saying this sector good, this sector bad. Within financials, J.P. Morgan, unbelievable results. Goldman Sachs, disappointing. Even on the more consumer or less cyclical names, the, just this morning, two names we own. McDonald's is down 3%, Procter Gamble's up 5%. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Procter Gamble is not a cheap stock either. It's a pricey consumer mm -hmm. staple name that continues to perform. I've been waiting this for this for a long time. QEs made it very difficult for bottom-up stock pickers to shine in a market that was rewarding all comers. But I, I really believe we're in a bottom-up stock picking market, and I think we're going to be here at least 10 months out. So then does that benefit the companies like Procter & Gamble and some of the staples, which were laggards for quite some time because a lot of folks wrote them off? You're seeing the pricing power that they have. Yeah, is that well, what's You know what, Procter & Gamble back? is up from middle of 2018, so it's not exactly mm -hmm. a year, but like 15 months. Procter & Gamble is up like 80%. Mm -hmm. this, this is a company that was left for dead. Yeah. It's, it's been multiple expansions, it's been organic earnings growth, it's been a reorganization, and again, back to my theme, Procter Gamble is one of the truly great dividend growers of all time. Okay, 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 devil's advocate. Uh, and this came up in Hasbro, we were making fun of it, but yeah. in the earnings release, what got to me was what they said about tariffs, that they basically said the threat and enactment of tariffs reduced revenues in the third quarter, increased expenses uh, to deliver product to retail. Uh, is this like the beginning of 
of what we are expect. You're laughing. Why are you I, laughing? I'm laughing because my investment committee, I, I'm sorry, Art, <laughs> I, I think he's going to chime in with something even smarter than what I'm going to say. I said at the beginning of earnings season, any company that underwhelmed was going to blame it on the trade war. Oh, please. Weather, that, No Brexit, matter what. Right. And, and I believe the trade Paris. war is a huge yeah. factor. I'm just saying Hasbro <laughs> had a terrible execution quarter. Mm. So, of course, you have to talk currency, trade war, tariffs. Mm. But I, I don't think it's exactly the bottom-up factor in Hasbro's case. Fair. Yeah, and I, think right. that, I think that this is going to be the quarter if you're going to hear trade war and tariffs and, and, and complex supply chains and disruption and uncertainty. This is the quarter you're going to hear it. But it's also the quarter where the tone on trade is inflecting better. Mm-hmm. So just think about how bad we were in, the, in the, the month of May when everything blew up in trade and the entire month of August when every other day we were up or down 1% in the S P 500. That's dissipated now, and I think that's a good thing. We're in a better place on trade. So, you know, to your point, I think you can sort of write that off, write that commentary off if we can stabilize, get some small deal done, and then work our way into next year. And, and the currency markets have stabilized a lot. Back in August, it was the trade issue, it was the tariff issue, but there was so much uncertainty as to exactly what not only China was going to do with their currency, but what the Treasury retaliation was going to be. President Trump was saying some really erratic things around the currency side. That part is definitely stabilized and it's making for a little bit easier environment right now. We've spent the entire year concerned about the U.S.-China trade war. Mm -hmm. When you think about a hard Brexit happening and and how bad that would be for the global economy, that's much larger, I think, than than the the two largest economies in the globe having a fight. I think this would be mass. It's not priced in whatsoever. So I think Mm -hmm. we've made this assumption all along, and at some point in time, this will get accomplished, and there won't be a, a hard Brexit. That's not the case at, as of yet. We'll, we'll learn a whole lot more today, but I think that's not pricing the markets. I have a contrarian view on this subject. I, I don't think there will end up being a hard Brexit, but I would not mind one bit if there were, and I'd be happy to trade it. I, there's nothing I'd like more at this point than for them to call that bluff. I think that but you're it, a bottoms up guy. How do you I, bottoms I, up? Well, from an asset allocation standpoint, uh, we're bottom up dividend growth portfolio managers, but we have to asset allocate our clients. And so we're still having to select asset classes across fixed income equities alternatives. And those weightings are very much dependent on macro top down events. But I go back to when Brexit passed in June 2015. The markets were down 1,000 points in the 48 hours afterwards. Mm -hmm. The markets had been up 500 points the week prior. One week later, the markets were up 1,000 points. It literally lasted about three days. Since then, the pound, sterling pound has stayed within that trading range, and I don't believe markets would panic at the idea of a hard Brexit. For a couple days, elevated volatility, sure. But fundamentally, the markets are tired of this sort of chicken little conversation conversation that never seems to come through. They need to get a deal done. They can get a deal done. It does add to volatility, but I just simply believe that you never need to be afraid of going long freedom. And this is an ideological comment, but I think that ultimately UK is much better off on the other side. And the CapEx is the same issue in the UK right now with business investment. It is, although I actually think the CapEx deceleration is far more trade-oriented than Brexit, even in UK. Certainly here, the macro headwind that our referring to that we've been monitoring very closely. I think it's the biggest event going on in American economy Mm -hmm. is that incredible move up in business spending, business expenditures. When the Trump administration began, he lost all of that momentum around the trade war. And that's why you went from what was it, 3 percentage GDP growth to high ones, low twos. But in, in the U.K., how much of the CapEx slowdown is Brexit-related? Remember, they were slowing down way before Brexit. So they have other macro events they're mm-hmm. sorting through economically. Long freedom? Is that... Is that I'll, uh, I'll stand by I'm, those words I'm as long as you have me on your show. Ste- Talk about the technology, David. I mean, that's also raising the cost. And we're starting to see a lot of the bigger producers, I guess, kind of fill somewhat of the void that maybe some of the mid-sized producers uh, can't sort of do on their own. I'm just wondering, how does this sort of reshape, uh, particularly the U.S.? Uh, energy industry, particularly because shale has been just such a huge driver for this economy over the last few years. Yeah, I think a lot of the factors that you're talking about are why we chose to play it with the integrateds, with the Chevrons and the Exxon Mobiles versus coming into mid-cap mm-hmm. E&Ps because, for one thing, the balance sheet strength and the diversified revenue lines. 
Um, I still am a huge believer in the infrastructure story. I believe we are a full generation behind where we need to be. But there's more political risk domestically when you have leading presidential candidates talking about banning fracking, talking about banning export of liquefied natural gas. These are stories that could be 10-year economic growth drivers that are somewhat up in the air politically. Now, I don't believe that's going to happen, um, but it, it is hard to not have that be a sort of headwind over the space right now. For Frankly, even with a very favorable Trump administration right. to the sector, it's, it hasn't been able to get that re-rating that we would have thought it would have had by now. So long term, I mean, that's something that's going to have to be reckoned with. In the short term, you still have the demand issues here. And you've got, you know, from OPEC to you know, IMF to even the individual banks cutting their outlook for demand globally, yeah. that is. Um, is this sort of, is this something that we think we could, those companies can sort of weather over the short term uh, without sort of getting into too much trouble? Yeah, we have a very simple rule about yeah. this when we see forecast that demand is, is suffering that yeah. wait for those things to get redone in three months and six months. <laughs> it's literally been 20 times in a row yeah. since 2015 that people have underestimated demand. Uh, on this whole point of the conversation, uh, breaking headlines here for us. Saudi Ramco is said to be pushing to complete its mammoth IPO. Investors, though, are going to find a way to embrace this, right? I suspect yeah. that they will. It'll be very heavily dependent on sovereign wealth, but I think. But that would you sell your integrated positions to absolutely buy not? I'd buy more of my integrated positions because I believe that there's no way they bring it public at $52 oil. I think you get $62 oil. I avoid the operational risk of their and valuation risk of their play, and stick with my Chevron and Exxon Mobil. Huh? That's interesting. So you're not concerned about sort of Ramco sort of sucking the air out of the room, then? Um, I'm not. But again, yeah. we're long-term holders yeah, of Chevron yeah. and Exxon, and so okay. even if there was a re-rating, but these things are already priced to single-digit multiples. Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's that much air that they can suck out. I think there's really great value in Chevron and energy, and you can't say that about a lot of the big cap market. That's one sector that I think there's really good value. On the Bloomberg terminal this morning about how more tankers are headed toward China uh, than at any time that we've seen in the last you know, two or three years. I mean, there is still an appetite out there for crude, and obviously China's issues may be stockpiling maybe ahead of some of the other issues going on in the Middle East. But the demand is there. And if we get resolution to some of these trade issues, doesn't the demand go back? I think so, but I also think that the demand of analysis depends on timeline. When we talk about there's a buildup of inventories and you get a bearish outlook over three mm -hmm. or six months relative to demand, they're not factoring in five-year needs that I think are undersupplied mm -hmm. with emerging markets. So, so we talk always about China, but not nearly enough about the rest of the EM universe. Mm -hmm. I just have not read anything that struck me as intellectually credible that suggests that demand is not going to exceed expectation five years out. And and that really needs to be the thought process because we don't have the em energy infrastructure in the U.S. to meet that demand. We need, we're the marginal producer on crude now. We need to get ready for that obligation and be prepared to export our liquids to the world. Really great conversation this morning, guys. Thanks a lot.